Hi, Craig. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm doing all right. Good. Let me introduce this. This is The Right Show, available on both streaming video and audio podcast. You are Craig Harleen. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Uh, and you are a professor of history at Brigham Young University. Right. And you've written a book called A World Ablaze, The Rise of Martin Luther and the Birth of the Reformation. And I think it's not an overstatement to say it could not be more timely. It came out uh, a month or two ago, and as we tape this, we are only a few days away from what is commonly considered the, the birthday of the Reformation, the day when Martin Luther began promulgating his famous 95 Theses. Turns out there's some controversy over whether he actually posted them on the, on the door of the church at Wittenberg, but, but he launched them, right, on, on October 31st. Uh, 1517 he did in some sense launch his yeah that's right he at least wrote them and sent them around okay so there's a it's an interesting book focuses on martin luther the person especially during this part of his life um a lot of things to talk about but at first i wanted to just ask um when you say the world ablaze yeah it's a pretty dramatic title in what senses did he set the world ablaze well, he used that phrase himself in one of his letters, and he said his enemies had accused him of setting the world ablaze with his 95 theses. So he's using it maybe a little dramatically himself. But yeah. there were times there was fire in his life. I mean, he was he was threatened with uh, execution and he burned some of the books of the pope and some of the pope's men burned his books. So there's plenty of fire in the story. Plenty of actual fire. And then in addition to that, there is metaphorical fire. I mean, he did he did start a, a, a revolution, gave birth to the Protestant church and ultimately a bunch of Protestant denominations. Yeah. And, and the, the, real, the real blaze part started, I think, after the period of this book. So. OK. And then there were the so-called wars of religion uh, some decades later that some people, you know, that had uh, something of a religious coloration, I guess, which is why they're called that. Uh, so let's start out by. I want to mention two. Th I think the two things you most commonly hear about what this was about uh, are, on the one hand, they say that Luther was uh, in his rebellion against kind of the Catholic Church. He was motivated by some complaints about how the church was conducting itself, notably in the infamous sale of indulgences, which we'll talk about. The other thing you hear is about this kind of... Uh, the, the doctrine of salvation. He, he had a different view of uh, what it takes to be saved for a Christian to be uh, guaranteed eternal life. Right. Then was the prevailing view. Now, these are not totally unrelated, uh, but, but why don't you um, first tell us what was the deal? What, what were indulgences? What was his gripe about the way they were being handled? Sure. The justification by faith came first chronologically, but yeah. By, by that, and I say by that we mean, you know, his view of what grants salvation. It is. That's right. The, that's the right. Faith. But the indulgences are the thing on October 31st, and so that's what we that's what we want to talk about. Basically, indulgences were part of the sacrament of penance. There were seven sacraments in the Catholic Church, and the sacrament of penance had three parts. You you were contrite. You confessed and received absolution, and then you did satisfaction, which meant you carried out some kind of punishment. You went on a pilgrimage. You said so many prayers. The indulgence was it meant a kindness, and it was designed to relieve you of the burden of doing the satisfaction or the punishment. Say you got sick or injured or even you died. You know, you still had to carry these things out. And so the indulgence changed it to something lighter, usually some kind uh, of offering. That was the theory of it. And Luther wasn't necessarily against that theory. He learned about them because he wasn't just a professor at the university. He was also the city preacher. And so his people in his congregation, they bought indulgences. And they were very popular um, because they were designed, you know, they, they, they were designed to relieve you of your punishment. But by Luther's time, they started making bigger claims. And that's what he had problems with, that they would keep you out of purgatory, for instance or that uh, they would reduce your time in purgatory, or they would even forgive your sins. And Luther said, no, they have nothing to do with that. So uh, he 
uh, he saw that these were pretty popular. They were also really popular with princes and churchmen and cities who used the proceeds. They were given the ability to sell indulgences in order to build things. So they built bridges, universities, churches. Martin Luther's own university and the church where he preached were built by indulgences. They were all over Europe. They were like bonds today. So they were really a popular way of financing things. And uh, people who were afraid of purgatory and also of sudden death, they were eager to buy them. Um, and so Luther, again, wasn't against the theory. He was against what he perceived as their, how they were being used now. That, was, that became to be the big problem. So, so uh, an indulgence was not quite a ticket to heaven per se. It just meant that you might spend less time in purgatory before uh, hopefully getting to heaven? Well, that was a problem with the latest indulgence, with this the indulgence for St. Peter's, which was to help build St. Peter's. Um, it was making claims that, yeah, it was a ticket to heaven. It was forgiving your sins. And Luther thought, you know, this exchange of money for indulgences was ridiculous. That, that the Pope helped, you know, promote an indulgence to build St. Peter's wasn't surprising at all. It was the most routine thing in the world to do that, because, again, that's how most things were built. But um, Luther didn't like the theology. The other problem with it in Germany was that um, Germans were really tired of indulgences by now. They had bought a whole bunch of them in the 15th century. And this latest indulgence was also saying, oh, by the way, all your past indulgences are no longer valid. You have to buy this new one. <laughs> so people were not happy about this at all. There was a lot of sentiment against the Pope. And, and so, you know, when Luther started complaining about them, people uh, were willing to listen. So this is when he gets the idea. You know, he's going to write his theses about them. But in order to understand that, that was the most routine thing in the world, too. Well, professors uh, at universities had the right to dispute subjects that weren't settled. So if you're a professor of theology, you disputed unsettled points of doctrine. And indulgences were not settled. There was a lot of disagreement about them. So Luther had every right to hold a disputation. And to have a disputation, you needed theses for the disputants to argue about. So Luther would write them up, or whoever was in charge of the disputation would write them up, and then they would print about 30 copies, and they would put one on the university bulletin board, which was the door of the university church. So there were other, a whole bunch of notices there. So actually, actually pinning it up was as dramatic as a professor stapling something up in a student center somewhere mm -hmm. right? just that that itself the act itself was meaningless and, and just for the record is your is your view that he probably did pin them up there because that would have been the no. routine no so here's the thing he posted all of his other theses almost certainly these he did not because even though you had a right the professors had the right to dispute unsettled points this one was so controversial in practice that most professors wouldn't touch it and his friends told him don't do it and luther knew it was controversial himself and that's why and there was no disputation held as there usually was when you put up theses, that's the best sign that he probably didn't post the theses, that he sent them around to some bishops and a few friends. But he did send them on October 31st, right? Yeah, that's right. And he sent them on that day because the next day was All Saints Day, and that was a big day for indulgences. And he wanted to remind bishops and theologians that, you know, they had to be used rightly. And, and so that's why he, he sent out probably about 35 copies now, the church, the church that he apparently didn't pin them on the door of was called All Saints Church. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's the university church. Yeah. It's, the, it's also the castle church. It doubled as both of it. It belonged to the castle of his prince, Frederick, who was the patron of the University of Wittenberg. And so he said, here, use my church. You know, you can have debate. They held, they held disputations there. They held sermons there, uh, some classes. But November 1st is also, as it happens, called All Saints Day? It's All Saints Day. That's right. And it's All Saints Church, yeah. Okay. Uh, so that, and that was his biggest single complaint about how the church was doing business. I mean, we should say that in among these theses, he like took a dig or two at the Pope that you might have suggested he not take, right? I mean, like, like he specifically said, like, why doesn't he use the why doesn't the Pope use his own money to build St. Peter's? Exactly. That, that, the problem was, and his friends all told him, they said, don't start writing theses about indulgences. It's not worth it. It's not an important subject. Um, the problem is, if you wrote about indulgences, you had to write about the Pope. And Luther said, I'm not going to write about the Pope. I'm only going to write about indulgences. But yeah, it was impossible. The thing was, the popes were in charge of indulgences because they were based on the excess good deeds of the saints, the treasury of merits. The Pope handed those out through, through indulgences. So 
um, if you if you criticize indulgences, you just you couldn't help criticize the Pope. Luther tried not to, but yeah, there were a number of theses that explicitly said things like that. Like you know, he's what he's what he did when he did that was very clever. He said people are saying, or what are we supposed to say when people say, oh, why doesn't the Pope build the St. Peter's with his own money? So he wasn't saying himself that he was doing that. So he went out of his way to say, I'm not criticizing the Pope and I'm not against indulgences. It's important to understand that at the beginning. Okay. Now, as for the other, the other big, uh, well, kind of uh, innovation. I mean, I mean, maybe the biggest single innovation he's known for in terms of doctrine. This business of what it takes to to uh, to get salvation. One thing that comes through in your book is that, you know, to understand why this was a big issue with him, you have to understand what kind of person he is and or was and. I think it's safe to say that he had an extreme form of a problem that a lot of people have in more modest form, which is that they're kind of hard on themselves, right? Yeah. And I want to yeah. read this paragraph from your book that kind of drives home how hard he, himself he was. Huh. Now, you refer to him as Brother Martin because he was a friar, which is right. kind of like a monk, except less monastic. The friars actually go out into the world, but, but, That's right. but they might live in a monastery. So anyway... No matter what Brother Martin did, his sense of sin wouldn't leave him. He tried to keep every single rule, and when he broke a rule, he more than made up for it with severely penitent deeds. But all the coarse clothing he wore, and floors he scrubbed, and latrines he cleaned, and flesh he chastised, and begging he did, not to mention all the blanketless sleeping in winter, and three-day fasts, and all-night vigils, and sometimes six-hour confessions still weren't enough to make him feel like he'd ever be rid of his sins and thus be righteous or justified before a perfect and righteous and therefore surely demanding God. Even when he did something right on the outside, there was still something wrong with him inside, usually a lot of pride at having done the right thing. That's, of course, in his judgment, that it was ba- even if you did something good, you were, you'd wind up being bad because you'd be proud of it. That's right. So uh, probably a lot of people can relate to a very modest version of that, but, but but he seems like extreme. Do you think he would have been less extreme in his own day? I mean, was there? Do you, do you think there was more of that about by by virtue of of the idea that uh, you know salvation depends on 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 this kind of conduct? Well, the more I think about this, and the more I think it might even come down to a matter of personality, because there were other personalities that weren't as hard on themselves. So it, where did it start? Did it start with a sense of sin? Did it start with his personality? Did it start with a the theology? And I think it started with his, with his personality. He was very hard on himself, and the monks were used to this. They, he was not the only person who did this. But not, again, not everyone did. But those who did, they had a name for it, and they called it the bath of hell, or another word, overscrupulousness. So you were too scrupulous about all the things that you did wrong. And it's kind of an occupational hazard when your job is to look inside yourself most of the day and find sin. Mm-hmm. You know, that you're, that you're definitely going to find it. And the question is, how, how badly are you going to take it? So that was that, that was his problem. And the theology that emerges from that is really personal as a result. In other words, this is the answer he's hoping to a personal problem. It's not just an intellectual problem. OK, so the shorthand version of what his view of salvation came to be is faith, not works. Uh Right now, now uh, it is so. First of all, so apparently, works is a label sometimes used to apply to the pre-existing view, the official church view. And so, can you describe what what that view was about salvation? Sure. sure. One thing to remember is that the church had always taught that salvation or justification came by grace. The, the church had always believed that, and by the grace the... of God, it, it's a, it's a, it's in that sense, it's which means it's. Strictly speaking, unmerited. We don't deserve it, but God in his generosity offers right. it. However, the question was, how did you lay hold on that grace? Right. All right. And that's, and that's where the differences came in. And there might be a little earning there. So the, the current orthodoxy that Luther learned when he was uh, a new monk and studying theology, you know, toward getting his doctorate of theology, said this. Justification came by grace through doing all that lies within you. So you do everything you can. And then God will do the rest. Right. So that's how you get grace. Your, your good deeds take you to a sort of halfway station between sin and grace. And then your will can fully cooperate with God at that point. He comes down, gives you the grace that you need to really get salvation. And good and deeds. Can I just can I say So good yeah. deeds meant sinning as little as possible. 
and doing the opposite of sin as much as possible. Kind it, it, of it, it, and as well, in, in participating in all the sacraments of the church. Okay. Right? okay. Also, that was the best deed you could do, okay. but also helping the poor and so on. There were a number of good okay. deeds that you could do. So Luther just felt like, you know, no matter how much he did, it still didn't satisfy. Was, how, how do you know you've done your best? How do you know you've done all that lies within you? Because you can always think of something else you could have done, right? If you're an overscrupulous kind of person anyway. Some other people, they, they were perfectly happy with his formula uh, and, and, and weren't so disturbed by it. Well, he kept studying. He got his doctor of theology and he started looking at other traditions in order to get another view of how could you be saved. So there was a monastic tradition that was really important. And this was this said you got salvation through humility. You just admitted to God that you were a sinner. And by showing him how humble you were, you got salvation. That helped him, but then it raised the same old problem. How humble did you have to be, right? So because then, then humility became a kind of good work itself. Then there was another tradition within Catholicism, which said, and these were from the mystics, and that said you just, really the way you're saved is you just open yourself passively to God and say, I am yours. Save me. I, I, there's nothing I can do. And it, this is this is not about, you know, how, how humble you are. It's not about good works. It's just passively saying that really moved him. And then so did St. Augustine. You know, he read St. Augustine who said, you can't do any good work on your own. You have to first be filled with God's grace. God has to make you good. Then you can do good. So all of these things he works out into this solution that he comes up with, which justification by grace through faith alone. And it's not a brand new idea. It's mm -hmm. a Catholic idea. It's not condemned as heresy until 1545. So in 1517, this is still perfectly Catholic. And now we think of it, it's the foundation of Protestantism. It's the thing Luther cared most about. It's the foundation of all of his theology. But at the time when he tried to have a disputation about this, almost nobody even cared. They mm -hmm. all yawned. So we, we can't say it's the cause of the Protestant Reformation. We can say it's the cause of Luther's consternation and why he started studying everything so hard. And then indulgences kind of came along accidentally in the midst of all that. And they were really the thing that got the Reformation going. Is that I was going to ask because there was clearly an audience for what he was saying. So, you know, I think, you know, some printers in various towns kind of took it upon themselves to print up copies of his theses, I guess, anticipating a demand or something. But in any event, there turned out yeah. to be a demand Right. Uh, you know, and the revolution just kind of uh, started. I, he, it's almost as if he didn't have to do a whole lot. And you, so your take, why was the audience so receptive? Was yeah, exactly. Exactly. When, when he so he printed up his 99 theses about justification by faith alone and printed up 30 copies. No printer took those and said, oh, these can be a bestseller because no one paid attention. You know, it was a Catholic idea. It was a minority idea, but it was still within the Catholic tradition. Nobody paid attention. When he did the 95, he printed up 30, 35 copies, and he sent them around to some friends. And all of his friends said, wait a minute, there's something here that people are going to like. And so they took it to printers, and probably several thousand copies of these sold, which is the first and last time in Western history that a set of academic theses, you know, was a kind of good seller. And, and the reason why, the, what they recognized, was what Luther refused to admit, was that if you wrote about indulgences, you wrote against the Pope. And there were a lot of Germans ready to be against the Pope. So this really resonated. The, the thesis, the first batch was in Latin, and only the educated, the, you know, the very elite of society could read those. But um, then some, some enterprising printer translated them into German, and, that, and those started to sell even more. And Luther was furious when that happened because he said, ordinary people don't understand our culture of disputation. They don't understand we exaggerate, we attack, and they might think I'm against the Pope. So, so he decided to write something really short for ordinary people called the Sermon on Indulgences and Grace. And that became the first bestseller. That sold like 24,000 copies. You mean the in first bestseller in the world? Well, in the, you know, in the Western world. Uh, 24,000, a lot of authors would be happy with that now. Oh, I'm really happy. So I mean, <laughs> especially and, and, academics, yeah. <laughs> and you, and yeah, and you multiply that, you know, exponentially because almost nobody could read, right? Ninety, eighty to ninety percent of the population couldn't read. So people are hearing Luther's words through sermons, through somebody on the street corner, through their friend, whatever, and through songs, and they're taking this message. This has mass appeal, and and Luther again trying to say it's not about the Pope, but that people made it about the Pope anyway. So, indulg yeah, the, the indulgences really were the thing that started it. And and did do you mean by that that they started it because they gave him a, a, 
an excuse to write something that was taken as anti, uh, anti-pope or because uh, the indulgences really were the burning issue. In other words, were there a lot of different reasons that the German people had issues with the Pope and indulgences was just one of them, but they took Luther to be carrying the, the anti-papal uh, yeah. banner or what? Right. Well, they, there was a lot of resentment that a lot of German money was going to Rome. Church taxes, mm-hmm. um, the wars, the, the German emperor named Maximilian fought a lot of wars in Italy. And the German assemblies gave him a lot of taxes in order to do that. So there's this sense, they would say, there are all these golden or, you know, coins flying over the Alps in, def- in defiance of nature, right? And it, in retrospect, you can see that Germans didn't have much more money proportionally going to Rome than any other country, but that was the perception. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that was what mattered. And so indulgences were part of that. Mm-hmm. Um, Frederick, uh, Luther's Prince Frederick complained about that. There, you know, all this indulgence money is going toward Rome. Neglecting for him to say that he was selling indulgences himself. He wanted that money to stay in Germany rather than go toward Rome. So, yeah, there's a lot of anti-Roman sentiment in Germany. And, and this is really, uh, this is what uh, people see in Luther. So um, you don't think that that uh, the justification by faith was a big part of the popular appeal? Because I can see how that would be appealing, right? I mean, if, uh, yeah. if you've been worrying that you have to get up every day and do everything right, and you think, well, all I have to do is believe that Jesus is my Savior, that sounds a lot easier. Yeah, it could it could have been. Uh, it, but the, all the signs are, all the evidence is that most people didn't care about it. The theologians cared about it. And over time... It came to be the hallmark of Protestantism. But at first, Luther complained his whole life that people didn't understand justification by faith. So it wasn't catching on in the way he wanted. When they were cheering him, when he finally rode into the city of Worms, you know, 2,000 people were lining the streets. I'm sure he was wishing that they would be cheering justification by faith alone. But instead, they're, they're cheering against the Pope is what they're really cheering. And so... Um, what, he, he got even more hostile against the Pope. For the first two years, he kept saying he's not really against the Pope. But then by the summer of 1519... He gets into a big disputation, and he studies even more, you know, the authority of the Pope. On indulgences, he was just studying the Pope's authority, say, over purgatory. Does the Pope have authority over purgatory? You know, it's, it's, it's out of this world, right? What, why does the Pope? But then he took this to talk about the Pope's authority in general. Is the Pope's office even approved by Scripture? No, he concluded. It, there's no really papal office until 600. So how can we say this is a divinely instituted office? Why do we have to pay it so much reverence? So, so indulgences were like the gateway drug to the bigger questions. Why do, you think, authority. why do you think he broadened his indictment? Was it because the, the Pope was giving him blowback about the original 95 Theses or because he sensed, whether consciously or not, the popular demand or what? No, it's, it's because all of his enemies kept insisting that, again, if he was against indulgences, he was against the Pope. And he wanted to show... No, I just want to understand the Pope's office rightly. We can have a Pope. We can respect the Pope. Um, he can be the head of the church, but it's a temporary office. It's not a divinely instituted office. Therefore, not everything he says is the word of God. Now, that was an official church doctrine anyway at the time, but that was, you know, some people were kind of regarding it that way and they were saying that Luther was against the Pope. And he wanted to insist at first that he wasn't. But then when he started writing, he started uh, researching it, it was like, OK, yeah, I guess I am against the Pope. <laughs> and it shocked him in the summer of 1519 when he realized, oh, man, I'm not only against the Pope's authority, I said it in public. And that changed everything. That That's what really made him desperate. Well, what did he... What did he discover in his research that led him to conclude that the Pope was not, in some sense, legitimate? Well, again, he, what he studied, in, first in the Bible, he completely reinterpreted whatever scriptures were relied on to say that the Pope was instituted from God, like Matthew 16, uh-huh. you know, on this rock, thou art Peter, and then also feed my sheep, telling the, uh, his, Jesus telling his disciples, feed my sheep. He says those are interpreted wrongly, so there's no biblical evidence. Uh-huh. So he says there's only historical evidence, and all that says that the Pope is only head of the Western Church from about 16, 600 on. 600. And then the documents, the major documents for that are from 1100. So this is clearly a human institution. And therefore, you know, we're not going to give it the same kind of respect. But again, he wasn't even for banning the Pope altogether at first. He, it was after 1519 that he really started to write more and more nasty well, things. Didn't he eventually equate him with the Antichrist or something? Oh, yeah, very quickly after 1519. And he's sure he's going to be excommunicated and executed. So even more reason to write desperate things. Right. And that that's when it's like, oh, I've got to get my message out. Here's what I really think. And in 1520, he wrote three major tracks 
that really, those were his first real attacks on the Pope, and those helped make him a folk hero. You know, people, that's what people wanted to hear. So justification, yeah, that's just, that's kind of in the background. That's what really motivates him, and that's what keeps him going and gives him his confidence. Uh, and some people are, of course, attracted to that, but they're mostly theologians. Uh, and, and many, many German people were happy with the system of indulgences, not all. It wasn't selling that great. That was another thing that hurt it. It, was, it didn't sell that great. That was something that's misunderstood because they had already bought so many indulgences in the previous century. So, you know, his, his opponents were really mad at him because he's hurting sales and uh, hurting their doctrine and leadership. Right. So then how did this actually start to give birth to alternative denominations? I mean, there was a certain amount of immediate kind of freelancing, right? I mean, just people just, yeah. uh, did they start start starting new sects and uh, or, or what? Well, they they usually call themselves a kind of evangelical or reform movement. Luther didn't like the word reform himself. He mm -hmm. thought only God could reform the church. Um, and he believed you can improve things that you had control over, like the theology, the curriculum of theology. So uh, at first, there was arguing within Luther's own camp, you know, what should you do? There, a lot of people agreed that there needed to be reform. He wasn't the only reformer by far, even, even before the thing with indulgences. Um, and so they started... Uh, saying, here's how we should worship now with these new reforms in place. Here's how we should regard the sacraments. Here's how we should regard the Pope. And, and so a lot of agreement, but also some points of dispute. And those points of dispute were enough to divide them. And so there was arguing in his own town of Wittenberg. There was arguing between him and some South German theologians, Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland. They could not satisfy, you know, solve their differences. They're, they tried coming together in 1529, all the major uh, reformers to that point. Um, and and they, they came up with 15 points that they thought it was important to agree on. They agreed on 14, but they couldn't agree on the 15th, which was the nature of the Lord's Supper. And that kept them from being a real, you know, unified body. Instead, we have all these groups that all have slight differences with each other that to them really mattered. Mm -hmm. And of course, today, the Protestant denominations have a lot of differences among them. Would you, Thousands, would you, yeah. would you say, is, is it easy to find something that, uh, you know, theologically, doctrinally, whatever that, uh, or, or, or in a more vaguely spiritual sense even, something that endures in at least most of the Protestant denominations that can be traced to the, really the early part of the Reformation and Luther's own approach and ideas? Oh, sure, the supremacy of the Bible. Luther, Luther thought that by making the Bible supreme, this would take care of things. Uh, Orthodox theologians said to him, what are you talking about? The Bible already is supreme. The question is, who has the supreme authority to interpret it? And that, of course, was the Pope. And Luther said, no, interpreting it for its own, on its own, that's, that's really how it ought to be done. And he was pretty confident, I think, that if people interpret, uh, studied it rightly, they would interpret it the same way he did. And it didn't work out quite that way. A lot of agreement, but a lot of disagreement as well. But that one thing that went through was, was you know, this right to interpret the Bible. Now, Catholics would say, see, we told you, you know, if you say that the Pope isn't in charge, you're going to break into all these groups. But Protestants would probably say, we don't care. You know, and if you talk, if you look at Protestant worship, say, even nowadays, I mean, local congregational worship is way more important than have a highly unified, you know, church structure. So and, and then this kind of personal connection to the Bible and to God, that, that matters way more. So it kind of depends on what, what you value most. They, they wouldn't say that that was a disaster at all. Yeah, but the irony is, I mean, when I say, well, what is the kind of essence of Luther in Protestantism broadly, and you say it's this, it's kind of your right to interpret, interpret the Bible, as you suggest, what that plays out into is that there is no essence of Protestantism. Because the, yeah. the denominations are free to interpret it as they want, there's almost nothing you can say about doctrine that distinguishes Protestantism from Catholicism that actually applies to all the Protestant denominations, right? Well, maybe justification by faith does seem pretty important. However, even there you start to get some arguing, you know, among the different groups, the Arminians and so on. There's like, well, there's justification by faith alone, except for a little bit of will on your part. And, and, the, and, the, and the Orthodox Protestants are saying, wait a minute, we can't say there's any will because then we're like Catholics, right? Yeah. Then, we're, then we're saying you're so. But, but I would say justification by faith is pretty important through most of them. Although even there, as I understand the the Calvinist predestinarian idea, it's that 
Faith isn't going to help either. We are all, I guess it's at birth, but at some point we are designated, you're in, you're out. You're getting to heaven, you're not. You don't know whether you are or not. And so, and this is a part I never understood. So you, so this should, the reason this should lead to good behavior, you'd think it would lead to, you know, complete, <laughs> complete dissolution, right? If, you're, if, you're, if, you, if your fate is right. already sealed. But the reason it's supposed to lead to good behavior is you kind of want to give people the impression that you're saved or something. I, I, don't, so, I, I don't follow it, but that's different from justification by faith, right? Yeah, if justification by faith almost always led to the idea of predestination, because if you didn't have any control, then God had control. And since God is omniscient, oh, he must have decided this in advance, who's going to be saved and who's not. And Calvin added, uh, by the way, we all deserve to be damned. So the fact that he's chosen to save some, we should be so thankful for, instead of saying, oh, he's damned some to, to, uh, to hell, right? It's like we should all be happy about this. So predestination almost always, it, it entered into Luther as well. He didn't, he didn't make it explicit as Calvin and especially Calvin's uh, disciples would. But, you know, it, it almost always enters in there. Luther and Calvin would say, if you think, because their critics would always say that if you believe in grace too much, you're, you're just going to lead a dissolute life. Because what difference does it make what you do? And Luther and Calvin would say, if you think that, you don't understand grace. Grace changes you. Grace makes you want to do good works out of love for God, out of love for your neighbor who's just as needy as you are. It makes for a better life. You know, even though those works have nothing to do with your salvation, it makes things so much nicer uh, around you. And it's a sign that God is working in you. So that's why it's important to lead a good life. It's a mm -hmm. sign that God is working in you. If you're not leading a good life, that's a sign that God hasn't really worked his grace in you. Now, when you say that uh, the, the doctrine of uh, justification by faith kind of naturally leads to a, a predestinarianism, uh, is that because the, from the beginning the, the doctrine of justification of faith involved like a rejection of free will or what? I mean, it's not obvious to me why it would lead to that. I, no, that's right. No, and I think it's, it, it's, I think that you hit the nail on the head, right? You, if you don't have free will, uh, then you're at God's mercy, and God is omniscient, therefore he knows who's going to be saved, who's not. Augustine was the first one to really work out this idea, and Luther relied on him. Uh, Augustine said the only cause of salvation is God's, for not, God's predestination. That was, that was it, and Luther and Calvin followed that. But yeah, if you're looking for the logic of it, I think it's in, the, it's in that view of free will. Did, did Augustine not believe in free will? Oh, right. No, he's he very know. limited. God had to fill you first. I mean, yeah. at a certain point, when like uh, God had to fill you first with grace before you could do good things. And then at that point, your will could cooperate with God and then do all these good things. And you could say, well, your will's operating then. But even Augustine would say, well, still, God was behind the original stuff, so really God's behind it all. I mean, it can get, it can get really confusing. And uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that Calvin and, and, well, at least Luther worked it out as clearly as, as some others, or as clear as he might have. Mm -hmm. And uh, is this all related to the Augustinian idea of original sin? I mean, it, it's, it's, yeah. if we're all born with these bad tendencies, you have to ask, well, what, what makes some people better? And the answer was God's grace. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, is, you know, I was brought up Southern Baptist, and I remember a lot of emphasis on accepting Jesus as your Savior. I mean, right. they, 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 they wanted you to behave well. They wanted you to not sin. But there was this notion that believing in Jesus was a kind of get-out-of-jail-free card. And, That's exactly right. And that, that is very... Is that a legacy of Luther? For sure. When Luther would preach... He would say the main thing to do is not necessarily to get people to go lead good lives. It's to get them to believe in Jesus ever more as their Savior. Mm -hmm. The more they believe that, the better life they will lead. And, and, and again, it, it kind of brings up the question, well, if it's all God's doing, then what good is it going to do? Well, the idea was the preaching would awaken them. You know, if they had God's gift, that they were destined by God, then the preaching would awaken them to live in such a way that they would recognize God's gift. So saying, accepting Jesus as your personal savior, that's a lot like Luther saying, you know, that God's grace uh, changed you. Uh, he would say a good person does good works, not a good works make a good person. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that, that was the whole key. Okay. So let's pick up the story then. Uh, I mean, your book kind of covers the several years after the controversy erupts so it erupts people pick up 
uh, his his at least some of his ideas, not all of the ones he would have liked, but pick up his ideas and run with him. And before terribly long, he finds himself at the at the diet of uh, is it worms or would you actually pronounce it worms? Worms, worms, yeah, worms, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, so so how does he he get there? I mean I mean what what are, what what are what, what's life like for him like a year uh, or two after starting to promulgate the theses? Right. So in the summer of 1518, the Pope actually started a legal process against him for heresy, all right? That got delayed a year because the Pope needed Luther's prince, Frederick, for something. So that delayed it a year. And then they had this disputation in Leipzig, and everybody thought the judges would solve the question of, is Luther a heretic or not? They took so long to decide, it got delayed another year. So from 1518 to 20, there's no real action against Luther. Finally, in the summer of 1520, the Pope says, that's enough. You know, he's starting to write all these anti-papal tracts now. And, then, and so they provisionally excommunicated him in June of 1520. And this said, but from 60 days, he has 60 days from the time that he gets this excommunication to recant. And if he recants, he won't be excommunicated. But if he still is stubborn, he'll be excommunicated. So he gets it on October 6th, 1520, and he sits on it for a couple of months, and then he burns it. It's like, uh, no, I'm just, I, I don't even care. Uh, I, 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 anyway, all this time, he's, he continues to ask, and his prince continues to ask for a hearing. He wants a hearing on German soil to determine once and for all, is he a heretic? The Leipzig disputation didn't solve it because the judges refused to decide. They just said, no, nah, too complicated. So he just wants a hearing so he can prove he's not a heretic. He wants to be a good Catholic uh, you know, son. So... Um, but when the probe finally excommunicates him, he's like, that's it, I'm going to burn the bull. This really hurts his chance of getting a hearing. However, Prince Frederick is, again, very instrumental in getting the emperor, who's now Charles, to allow Luther to have a hearing at the next assembly, or diet, as it's so called. So Prince yeah. Frederick is the prince of the area in which Wittenberg is? In Sixth Saxony, exactly. There were 300... There were 300 states in Germany. There was no such thing as Germany. They, right. It was called the Holy Roman Empire. 300 states, and, and Frederick's one of the princes, and he's the most powerful prince of all. He just happens to be the most powerful prince of all. And so he arranges for Luther to get a hearing at the next uh, assembly or diet, and it was going to be held in the city of Worms. Or Worms. And so that's why they call it the Diet of Worms. You, know, it, you, you imagine up all kinds of unappetizing things when you hear that, but it's just an assembly in the city of Worms. That's where the next one happened to be. They were held every two years or so. Um, and so Luther travels there on foot, 300 miles. Actually, no, he goes in a carriage this time. Usually he's on foot. Goes in a carriage, and he, he gets there uh, for the hearing Frederick's arranged for him. And really, it's not even a hearing. He's just supposed to submit. He's given a chance to recant, and that's it. And he's shocked because he feels like, wait, I, I came here to dispute. You know, I'm a professor. We dispute things. We don't just shut up because somebody tells us. So he expects to have his disputation. He starts talking, and they say, no, we're not going to do that. But finally, they agree to let him make an answer. And this is when he gives his famous speech, that in, both in Latin and in German. And he just he, he refuses to recant his writings. He says, I can't. I can't recant them because, uh, I, you know, I feel like they're from God. Mm -hmm. And there's a famous line that may or may, he may or may not have actually uttered. What is that? Uh, something about, here I stand, I can do no other. He, he almost certainly did not say, here I stand. So it's ironic that all the things we remember best about Luther are probably <laughs> things he didn't do. <laughs> and that's because we tend to do this with heroes or, or villains. We tend to remember the things about them we want them to have done, uh -huh. right? Now, he, 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 never, he actually wrote his speech out after, after he gave it. He went back to his room, wrote it out, and he never said, here I stand. That was added you know, decades later. But, but he, he did, did say, what, what, my conscience is captive of God yeah. or something? Exactly. It can't go against his conscience and God help me. Amen. It's not good to go against your conscience. He didn't mean by conscience what you mean or what we mean today. What did he mean? You know? Well, by conscience, we think of it's just kind of this irrefutable thing because this is what we happen to feel. Luther, the conscience was kind of the battleground where God and the devil work things out and his conscience was captive to God. So he I was sure see. that his conscience was on God's side. This wasn't just about personal conscience in the way a modern person would understand it. That's interesting. So, uh... So then, so he basically, uh, he, he's, uh, I don't know what the word is, convicted or whatever. Uh, and yeah, then he's, what, he's, go ahead. he's put under the imperial ban. He's put uh -huh. under the imperial ban. That means he can be arrested. Nobody can give him protection. 
uh, or they'll be subject to arrest themselves. So, yeah, it's, it's serious. And he's excommunicated a few months later by the Pope. Yeah, but then something less like right out of a movie happens. That's right. Uh, he, he's, he's promised a safe conduct to and from the diet. And so uh, he leaves the diet and, and Charles says, yeah, I'll let you go home. But as soon as you get home, I'm coming after you. Right. So on his way home, uh, his prince, Frederick, is afraid that Luther is going to be kidnapped by Charles. And he's, he's going to go back on his word. And so Frederick's men kidnap Luther instead. As soon as they get into Saxony, right, they have to cross all these lands. As soon as they get into Saxony, they kidnap him and they put him in Frederick's loneliest castle. He's got about 12 of them. And he puts him in the, the Wartburg, as it's known. And, and that's where he spends the next 10 months. And was it not they were trying to keep it a secret where he was, basically? Oh, yeah. Nobody, nobody knew at first. I mean, there were all kinds of guesses. And he would write on the letter. He, he had one contact outside. All of his letters went through one contact um, who was uh, Frederick's secretary named George Spilatin. So he sent all his letters through him and he would write things on it like from Bohemia or from wherever, you know, so that people wouldn't know. There was speculation. People speculated that Frederick was protecting him. See, Frederick couldn't protect him in the open because then Frederick could be placed under the ban and other princes could invade his territories and take it from him. And there were princes eager to do that. So Frederick, this is how he gets his nickname later on, the wise, Frederick the wise. He, he takes this very subtle path and he, he protects him in secret and tries to make sure nobody knows. Not even Frederick's brother, who was his co-ruler, knew where Luther was until he happened to visit the Wartburg about four months into Luther's stay there. And it's like, oh, there's Martin Luther. So this was really highly classified information. And why did uh, Frederick want to protect Luther? I mean, presumably he could have just let him uh, be served justice as the church saw fit, and it wouldn't have hurt him, right? Well, it, it depends. Uh, Frederick was a very skilled prince and a very honest prince, and he said, until he's convicted by a court that I regard as valid, mm. then I can't just arrest him and send him off to Rome for heresy, because what kind of a prince would I be? What would my other subjects think of me? I would do this for any of my subjects. So we tried to take this kind of neutral position on Luther. Also, um, yeah, he could let he could turn Luther over, but he, Luther was his star professor, and, and he had only one university. He's very proud of his university. And his star professor is bringing hundreds of students there. The last thing he wants is for him to be convicted of heresy. So he finally says, sure, if he's convicted of heresy by a court I acknowledge, I'll arrest him. But until that time, I'm not going to arrest him. So th this was, uh, uh, among other things, uh, a skirmish in the ongoing uh, kind of tension between secular authority and, and uh, the church's authority. Sure. I mean, there was also a skirmish between political princes, right? I mean, because he's, he's, he's at odds with a lot of princes around him as well. Mm -hmm. So then what happens? So Luther eventually uh, comes out, out in the open, right? Well, uh, there's trouble back in Wittenberg because, again, they can't agree on what it means to reform the church. So a lot of his followers are doing some one thing. Some of his followers are doing another thing. And after 10 months of this, Luther hears about it. And he finally says, I got to go back. Frederick doesn't want him to go back yet because, again, they'll both be in trouble. So, but Frederick or, or Luther says, no, I got to go. You don't have to protect me anymore. If the emperor shows up at the gates, let him in. Let him take me away. But I can't leave Wittenberg uh, just to, in the, this kind of disarray and arguing the gospel is getting a bad reputation because this is my town. And if things go badly here, we're going to get a bad reputation for the gospel all over Europe. So that's why he snuck back. And through a whole bunch of luck and political skill, he, you know, nothing ever happened, nothing happened to him. He could never leave Saxony again because he was under the ban the rest of his life until he died in 1546. But yeah, thanks to Frederick's protection, thanks to the uh, other princes who were either sympathetic to Luther or sympathetic to Frederick, to his sovereignty. They didn't want Frederick's sovereignty to be disturbed because somebody might come and disturb their sovereignty then. So there are a lot of reasons why Luther survived. And but what are the... What are the issues he was most concerned about? Why did he uh, want to get back to Wittenberg so badly? A lot of it had to do with how they were changing the worship service, right? If you're going to change, if you're going to reform the church, one of the most uh, basic things to do is change how you worship. And so Luther had already written several tracts saying, um, you know, we don't need all seven sacraments. We only need two. Um, and the one, one is the Lord's Supper and one is baptism. And the Lord's Supper, we can celebrate that differently than we're celebrating it now. They used to give only the wafer, and only the priest was allowed to drink the wine. And Luther's saying, why shouldn't we have both the wafer and the wine? You need both elements for it to be a complete sacrament. 
So a lot of people were eager to start doing that, but you know, it's hard for us to imagine what a big deal that was. That was so radical, and you really have to take some modern equivalent to try to imagine why that was so upsetting to a lot of people. Well, they're arguing over whether to do that, how to do that, and, and they're saying, look, this is what Luther said, so of course we have to do it. But Luther's saying, wait a minute, not so fast. You can't go that fast. We've got people here in the church who have been told their whole lives that they have to do things a certain way at church, and their salvation depends on it. And now all of a sudden you're just ripping that out from under them. Mm -hmm. So we've got to respect that. So he comes back and he says, we're starting over. We're going to go really slow. He dressed up like a monk again. He, you know, cut the hair on top of his head, the tonsure. He's Brother Martin. He's not some wild-eyed, you know, non-Catholic fellow. He's Brother Martin. And he says, we're going to go slow. And so he doesn't implement this new kind of mass for about three years. He, he just wants so all people. of this is still done uh, under the rubric of Catholicism. Uh, yes, that's right. That's right. And when does that start to change? I mean, at some point, there's something called Lutheranism, uh, which yeah. is not part of Catholicism, and there's other things as well. So when do we finally see a distinct Protestantism emerge? Well, people who called it Lutheranism were, were intending that as a slur. And most religious nicknames are slurs, huh. if you stop and think about all of them. You know, they're all slurs at some point. And so people who, they, they wanted to, um, if they wanted to discredit you, they would call you a Lutheran, right? You're following Lutheran. And Luther hated that. He didn't want anybody to call themselves a Lutheran. But that starts in the 1520s. In 1529 is the first time the word Protestant is used. And that's because some of the, many of the princes protested. And it wasn't just religious things, but some other things as well. But they all happened to be supporting Luther's view of, of the gospel. And as a result, they start to be lumped together as Protestants. So Zwingli emerges in Switzerland in the 1520s. Calvin emerges in Geneva in the 1530s. Um, we have other reformers, Bootser, uh, and, and so on in the Swiss cities. Um, and, and so, yeah, from the 15, really from the 1520s on, um, these, these different denominations are emerging. Okay. But none under the, uh, under the control of Luther. Uh, not really. He, his movement becomes most popular in the center of Germany, the east, a little bit in Eastern Europe, and then Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, northern to central Germany, Scandinavia, and a little bit in the east. And then it becomes an international religion centuries later when it goes to the Americas uh, and other parts of the world as well. But that was where its main working uh, foundation was. He, Luther got a little unpopular in the south after the Peasants' War of 1524 and 25. Um, the Which, South stayed mostly Catholic anyway. Yeah, because he was uh, not on the side of the peasants at that point. Is no, that right? No, he was really against them, and and, and some of them didn't and, like and they, that. They felt betrayed. Yeah, he's but he was still really popular. And uh, Calvin had the more had the greater growth and dynamism in the 1560s on. It was spreading into the Netherlands, also into parts of Western Germany, uh, into France, uh, and, and England in a way as well. So. Yeah, Calvinism was the was the language. Well, of the, uh, so the, I know that this goes beyond uh, the scope of your book. So when when did he die, and by that time, how much of a glimpse did he have of the magnitude of his legacy? Yeah, he died in 1546, and there were times in his life when he really doubted what he had done. Yeah, he saw that Christendom had been divided, and that was horrible. He he never intended that. That was like a nightmare to him that it had been divided that way. So he didn't like that. Um, if he would have lived a year longer, he would have seen Charles come and actually attack his city and take it apart and, and make it Catholic again. That only lasted a few years, but that would have been a really hard, that would have been a real heartbreak to him because uh, Charles invaded his town in 1547, or at least Charles's troops did. So, um, uh, yeah, he, he, and he would often fear that he'd been led astray by the devil. There were times like in 1527 where he almost died from the psychological and physical strain. He was sick, but also the psychological strain that maybe he had done wrong, maybe he'd followed the devil. Um, so, he, so he doubted. Well, often, so this often. is the thing that got the ball rolling to begin with. His, his being obsessed with self-doubt is what led to the doctrine of uh, faith alone. Yeah. And, and he never entirely escaped this tendency, it sounds no, like. But it, it was also the thing that soothed him when he would come out of his bad periods. Yeah. yeah. So, um, in the end, uh, you know, it's a big uh, historians debate the question of, you know, great, great man, or I guess now it's great person, although in, in for much of history, we're mainly talking about men, um, versus, uh, you, you know, whatever they call the alternative. I mean, in one view, there are these great people who come along and actually change the course of history 
And had they not come along, like there would still just be one Christian church in this case, right? Uh, that's, what, that's, what, what, that's what some people are saying, but most historians, I think, believe that if Luther hadn't done it, somebody else would, because there were so many reformers at the time, and so many of the problems were being echoed in the same way that Luther did. Mm -hmm. It would have taken a different form, right? Because Luther had a certain personality, had a certain prince, but I mean, I think a lot of people yeah. think it would have happened. And besides, I mean, a lot of his personal stamp on it was actually lost in the long run, right? I mean, uh, um, I don't know about that. If you look at a Lutheran service now, I mean, it's still, you know, he believed in going slow with changing the service. It's, it's more like a Catholic mass than a, a service of Calvinist. Uh, right, but I mean, but I mean, most most Protestants aren't Lutheran. I mean, Episcopal is also a right. little Catholic, but but they're, yeah. but most of the Protestants in the world today are neither, right? No, that, that, that's right. They're mostly not Lutheran. But on the other hand, um, the idea of the Bible is supreme, justification by faith. Yeah. I think most of the mainstream Protestants are for those. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, a, rela a question related to that, uh, to the kind of, uh, you know, whether, whether how instrumental any one person actually is. Um, you know, as we said early on, printers took it upon themselves to print his theses. Could this have happened if the printing press had not been invented in the previous century? Oh, it would have gone much more slowly because they, they did write them out and send them around to people even without a printing press. But the printing press helped it to go a lot faster. Again, the theses weren't that big. of a, It was surprising that there were at least a couple thousand or a few thousand. But it was the, it was the sermons in German. Mm -hmm. The short things, eight pages long, those were what really made Luther famous. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, that, that really had a, that played a huge role, I think. Um, so there were lots of other conditions going on. It wasn't just Luther. I mean, we talk about this with students all the time. Um, you can't just say, oh, the, Luther's the cause of the Reformation. There are lots of causes of the Reformation. There's no doubt that his personality mattered and how, how he did things. And he was so stubborn and so sure of himself. That mattered a lot. But the strength of his prince probably mattered even more. Mm -hmm. You know, without that prince, Luther wouldn't have survived. And he happened to be, again, the greatest prince in the Holy Roman Empire. There might have been other Luthers, and we never heard of them because their prince didn't protect them. Mm -hmm. Or they were anonymous monks who came up with justification by faith alone and feel, felt no need to share that with everybody else. They just saw that as a personal solution. Okay. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to say by way of sizing Luther up? Uh, he was an interesting guy. <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, that's what I. That's how I like to leave it. Really, is is with when any, anything I study is, you know, here's what this person was like. What was it like to be in their shoes? Is what I'm really after. And then it's up to people to kind of think, do I like that or not? So, uh, you know, my, I myself, I'm not. I don't know that I'd like being around Luther all the time. He's not very. He's he's not always real consistent, and I, I kind of like stability in friends. And and he could be up and down, but on the other hand, he's really interesting. He's really funny. He's, he's got a great ability to be pithy. You know, I mean, most professors can't go from the classroom out into the streets and, and write stuff that people will like. I think he was able to do it because of his experience preaching in the city church. You know, he knew how to approach ordinary people. But even a lot of preachers weren't very good at doing what he did. And so I really admire his ability to do that. I try to do that myself, right? I'm a professor, but I try to write for general readers. Hmm. Which brings us back. Uh, at the conclusion of our conversation to your book, it's called The World of Blaze, The Rise of Martin Luther and the Birth of the Reformation. It's Oxford University Press, right? That's right. Uh, but people shouldn't be scared away by the name of that publisher because Oxford <laughs> publishes both academic treatises and uh, more popular books. And this is definitely in that category. It's, it's uh, I think, I think you'd say it's part of their trade. Uh, it is. It's a trade. Operation. And it's very readable, not, not forbiddingly long very rich, colorful portrait of, of Martin Luther during these critical years. So congratulations, and congratulations on your timing. I mean, uh, it would be it would be terrible if you set out to write a book to coincide with the 500th anniversary and you didn't finish it in time. <laughs> no, it's, it wasn't coincidence. Every publisher in the world wanted to have a book. For, uh, well, you know, right, for but you might not have delivered in time, and then you would have it's had true. to wait until the 1,000-year anniversary, You're exactly, the next big milestone. Uh, Right. One of my curmudgeonly friends said, you know, I'm going to celebrate the 499th anniversary of the Reformation. I mean, why the 500th? He's, he's important all the time. It's not just the 500th yeah. year. <laughs> I, think, I think you have better commercial instincts than your friends. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks a lot. This was fun. Thank you.